Did you know that astronomy and astrophotography are not just a nighttime activity? You can also do it in the daytime. And during the day, you can see one object in particular, a bright star. Not just any particular star, but one that without it, life on this planet wouldn't exist. So come along for another astrophotography imaging session as I photograph our solar system's central star, an energy source for all living life on Earth, the sun. My name is Kwesi Akwa, and welcome to the Astro Park. The Sun is the star at the center of the solar system. It's a nearly perfect ball of hot plasma heated to incandescence by nuclear fusion reactions in its core. The Sun radiates this energy mainly as light, ultraviolet, and infrared radiation, and is the most important source of energy for life on Earth. The Sun is a G-type main sequence star, informally called a yellow dwarf, though its light is actually white. It formed approximately 4.6 billion years ago from the gravitational collapse of matter within a region of a large molecular cloud. Every second, the Sun's core fuses about 600 million tons of hydrogen into helium, and in the process converts 4 million tons of matter into energy. This energy, which can take between 10,000 and 170,000 years to escape the core, is the source of the sun's light and heat. So to photograph the sun, I'll be using my solar telescope, the Lunt LS80MT. And for imaging, I'll be using the ZWO ASI-174MM, a monochromatic solar system webcam. And as usual, this will all be mounted on top of the Orion Atlas Pro AZEQG. And to minimize the UV and IR wavelengths, as well as boost the contrast a little bit, I'll be using the Optolong UV IR cut filter. So with all that being said, let's head outside, take a walk in the park, and get everything set up for tonight's image. <laughs> Oh, uh, that, that didn't sound right. So with all that being said, let's head outside, take a walk in the park, and get everything set up for today's imaging session of the sun. Hey everybody, so 
I have all of my equipment set up and you're now looking at my solar telescope. This is the Lunt LS80 MT. So it's a doublet apochromatic refractor. So it has two lenses up front and one of the lenses is that ED or extra low dispersion glass to help minimize the chromatic aberration. And it has an 80 millimeter aperture at F7. So that gives it a 560 millimeter focal length. So it's, an, it's a nice medium speed and medium field of view. And the MT means that it's a modular telescope. So this telescope can be used for both daytime and nighttime observing and imaging. So I have it set up in the daytime configuration to image the sun in the hydrogen alpha wavelength. So it's a beautiful day in the park today and I'm really looking forward to seeing what the sun is cooking. So let's slow over to the sun, start up fire capture, and let's see what we can get. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm inside of fire capture and you're looking at a live view of the sun. And I'm using live in air quotes because technically it's not live. And I'll explain why that is when I talk about the interesting facts about the sun later on. But with hydrogen alpha, we're able to see a layer of the sun called the chromosphere. And in the chromosphere, we can see several different features. So if you follow my cursor here, if you see this black dot right there, these are sunspots. So these are the cooler regions of the sun and they have a high level of magnetic activity. And they can grow to be as large as the earth or even bigger. And they last on the sun from a few days to up to a month. And these dark lines right here that look kind of like a snake-like structure, these are called filaments. And filaments are basically solar flares, but they're seen from face on from our point of view. And these white splotches are the new active regions, and they can turn into coronal mass ejections, solar flares, or evolve into future sunspots. And if I temporarily turn up the gain a little bit, you can see on the edges here, are the actual solar flares. And these extend outwards into space hundreds of thousands of kilometers. And they're giant hot plasma flares. And if they loop back to the sun, they cause what's known as a solar prominence. And you can see a small prominence right here in the lower left where my cursor is, which I think is really cool. So let me put the gain back to where I had it at 190. Yeah, 195 is okay. So when we're imaging the sun, we have to deal with uneven light illumination as well as horizontal banding that you might see on the sun. And that type is called Newton's rings. And to eliminate these artifacts, just like what we do in deep space astrophotography, we have to take a series of flat frames for the sun. And there's two different ways we can do flat frames, depending on what you're shooting for the sun, whether it's a full disk image or an up close feature image. So I'll demonstrate how I do the full disk image right now. So just like in deep space astrophotography, you can use the white t-shirt method to take your flat frames, but I learned of a new technique called the white plastic method. So you basically use the white plastic from a grocery bag, for example. You can also use the white plastic from the cereal box that holds the cereal inside. And you can also use the white plastic from a milk carton. So 
All three of these methods work, but I decided to use the grocery bag method. So if you're going to use the bag method, you want to make sure that the bag is nice and taut around the aperture. You don't want any wrinkles, so you want to make it as smooth as possible. And I just hold it with a rubber band to hold it in place. So let's hop back over to the computer and take a look. Okay guys, I'm back on the computer and you'll see this gray image because you want to adjust the gain and the exposure to where your histogram is around 50 to 60% or so. So somewhere in the middle. And then once you have that set up, you can then click this checkbox here for flat field. And I'll just use the average of 20 frames and I'll click OK. And then when it's finished, you'll hear a beep. There you go. So now the flat field has been successfully created. So we'll be using these flats for our full disk image of the sun. So I'm going to hop back over to the telescope, take off the trash bag, and I'll be back in just a moment. Okay, so I took off the white plastic and we're back to the sun again. So I've adjusted my gain and exposure levels to adjust the histogram. So you want to keep it between about 60 to 80%, which is nominal. And you want to make sure that the flat field box is checked to make sure that our flat frames are activated. So once we do that, we can then start the capture of the sun. So I usually like to do a limit of 30 seconds because the features on the sun change very rapidly. So I usually like to take a small capture between about 30 seconds to about a minute or so. So we can click this red triangle to start the recording. Okay, so now we've started the recording and it's gonna take a 30 second video and I can review it later. So I'll be taking several of these where the scene conditions are as stable as possible. And we should have about five seconds left. And we're finished. Cool. So I'll take a look at that video for a further review. So the next thing I'm going to demonstrate is the up close features of the sun. So I'm going to install my two times Barlow lens and I'll be right back. So here's a little safety tip that I like to use personally. Whenever I'm making changes to my imaging train by putting in a Barlow lens or adding a new blocking filter, when I remove those devices, the telescope is still at its critical focus. So the light cone has the potential to reach the ground and that high intensity light can potentially start a fire. So what I like to do is put the dust cap on the front of the telescope, make my necessary changes, and then when I'm ready to image again, just take the cap back off and I'm all set to go. Okay, everybody, I've put on my two times Barlow lens, so we have an up-close view of the sun. And this is great to pick out any particular regions that you want to be interested in. So I'm going to look at this active region and sunspot in the upper center. So we'll have to retake our flat frames in this case. So I'm going to uncheck the flat field. And I'm going to reset. So when you're using a two times Barlow or any Barlow lens for that matter, for up close regions of the sun, to take the flat frame, all you have to do is simply defocus the image and make sure that the histogram is between 50 to 60%. And then you can shoot the flat field that way. So I'm going to temporarily defocus the image. So it has a, Evenly illuminated flat field. I'm gonna readjust the telescope. There we go. That way we want 
gray to cover the entire image. So I don't want any black in the corner. So let me defocus it a little bit more. I think that's good. So yeah, histogram is about 67. Let me make it about 60. So I'm going to temporarily lower it again. Yeah, I think that should be good. And then I'll recheck this flat box, flat field. Use an average of 20 frames. Click OK. And you'll hear the beep. And there it is. And now we have our flat field. So make sure that box is checked. And now you should refocus. So let me dial it back in. There we go. So it's really easy if you have features such as sunspots to focus, but if there's no sunspots in the image, you can just uh, slew over to the, the limb of the sun and you can focus on that as well. So it should be right about focused. Yeah, the scene conditions aren't too good today, but I'm doing the best that I can. There we go. So now you have to readjust the gain and exposure. So I'm going to take care of that real quick and I'll be back in just a moment. Okay, so I have my histogram set up. It's between 60 to 80% with the gain and exposure time that I want. So now I'm just going to hit the red triangle and start the recording of the sunspot and the filament region. So taking another 30 second video. So average frame rate is around 20 to 30 frames per second, which is fine. And I'm just gonna take several of these videos where the scene conditions are as stable as possible. So I have about five seconds left. And it's finished. So that's how you take pictures of the sun from a full disk view as well as an up close view. So I'm going to continue taking as many videos as I can where the scene conditions are as stable as possible. Hey everybody. So the imaging session is going pretty well so far. I'm taking several videos of the sun where the seeing conditions are as stable as possible. I have to put my computer inside of a plastic tub as well as put a black shroud to help me see it a little bit better. It does look a bit ridiculous, but hey, what can you do? So I wanna take a moment to talk about some interesting facts about our sun. First off, the sun is eight light minutes away from Earth, which translates to about 93 million miles. So what I mean by a light minute is, although light is the fastest object in our known universe, it's not infinitely fast. It takes time for light to travel from one location to the other. And we measure this by light minutes, light days, light months, or the classic light years. It's the amount of distance that light travels in those particular time frames. So when I say that the Earth is eight light minutes away from the sun, it means that the light emitted from the sun traveled through space for eight minutes before finally reaching us on Earth. So that means that every time you observe the sun in the sky, with the proper protection of course, you're not seeing the sun as it is, but you're seeing it as it was eight minutes ago. So basically, whether we're looking at galaxies, star clusters, nebulae, the moon, planets, or the sun, anytime we're observing things in space from Earth, 
we're actually looking into the past. So not only are our telescopes our own personal spacecrafts, they're also time machines. And I think that's really cool. And the sun is big, like really, really big. 1.3 million Earths can fit inside of the sun and 109 Earths can go across its diameter. So that just goes to show how massive our central star really is. Also, just like how the Earth goes through seasonal changes of spring, summer, fall, and winter, the sun also has seasons of high activity and low activity. And these are referred to as solar maximum and solar minimum, respectively. Every 11 years, the north and south poles of the sun physically switch places. And during this transition, we can see a high level of solar activity in the form of coronal mass ejections, sunspots, and solar flares. In December of 2019, we recently entered solar cycle number 25, and we're expected to reach solar maximum by April of 2024, just in time for the next eclipse across America. So, if you've been interested in doing solar observing or imaging, now would be a great time to jump into the action. Well, I've completed my video captures and I'm starting to wrap things up for today. I collected several videos of full disk images and up close images of the sun. And I'll select the ones that have the best seeing conditions and I'll use those to create the overall image. Observing and imaging the sun is a fun experience. And I highly encourage you to safely try it for yourself because it does give you something to do during the day when the nights are cloudy. So I'm going to take a moment to take some visual observations, then I'll pack everything up, go home, and cool off with a glass of iced tea. So thank you for watching Astro Park. Please enjoy the images of the sun at the end of this video. And as always, until next time, take care, and I wish you all clear skies.